the atmosphere has a half-life of seven years. In other words, the, it, it, whereas CO2 uh, lasts for a long, long time, in fact, it's, 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 it's permanent. And in that Nature article that, that I showed you a slide of early on where there was this uh, point-counterpoint between the Cornell people and myself, in that particular article, I pointed out that the fires that were burned in the early Sumerian cities in the Fertile Crescent, the CO2 that was released from those fires is largely still in the atmosphere to this day. On the other hand, gas that is leaked from the early development of the Mitchell Wells in the Barnett, let's say 14 years ago, and this goes back to uh, 1997, about the time of the first slick water frack, whatever methane leaked into the atmosphere, only one quarter of it exists right now is a greenhouse gas forcer. So that, that in fact, if you're worried about long range global climate change being forced by composition of the atmosphere, it's really CO2 that you have to keep your focus on. And this is one of the primary reasons why the atmospheric scientists really like shale gas as opposed to coal. Um, if the older, dirtier coal-fired power plants can get shut down and be replaced by uh, gas as a generation um, energy, because in, in fact, per BTU that's generated, you have only half the CO2 getting into the atmosphere. And this is, of course, part of the reason that, that groups like ANGA have touted natural gas as the clean fuel. It really is, in terms of a long-term greenhouse gas effect, truly. A, uh, a clean fuel. If you look at the long term, now if you look at it over 10 years, if you're worried about what it's going to be like um, by the time you retire, then you think about methane. But if, you, if you're concerned with the quality of your grandchild's life or your great-grandchild's life, then it's CO2. But clearly, I would say it's not 10, it's probably about 25 or 30. Uh, shale gas is is worse than coal over the short term because of the methane. Over the long term, of course, Terry's right. Uh, CO2 is going to be the big issue. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, it's the half-life. And so it depends on how short you want to make the window. And uh, if this is about you, then you worry about methane. But if it's about your grandkids, you worry about CO2. Well, I do water law, among other things, and one of the fascinating aspects of the debate about the environmental issues and r with respect to all our energy forms is often the effect on water, uh, other than this methane contamination that you've talked about, gets overlooked. And isn't it true that the coal industry also has a difficult time contaminating water? Well, that's, that's correct. In fact, uh, some of the companies in southwestern Pennsylvania are actually using um, coal-contaminated water, take, just, just taking them out of, out of surface mines and it, 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 let's see, I don't want to call it acid mine drainage. There's a word for that, that water. They're using that for their frac fluid, for example. And what that does is um, accomplishes something that's very important, which is that it starts to clean up what the coal industry left behind, using that water for a, a very good purpose without uh, um, drawing on uh, uh, or, or loading down, drawing down streams around Pennsylvania. However, uh, I have to point out that, that Pennsylvania has a lot of streams and, and water usage in general by the gas industry is not a problem. It may be more so a problem in very, very dry regions of the country or the world. Did you want to answer that? I, it, it was a question of scale. You know, if you look at two to eight million gallons of, of frac fluid per well, uh, that's a lot of water, uh, you know, likely compared to the cooling requirements of, of coal plants. So sure, I mean, uh, perhaps some of the, the acid mine drainage, if that's what you're referring yep. to, Terry, yep. could be reutilized. I mean, that's very clean water compared to reusing uh, waste frac water. But sure, if they can use that, if that's going to solve the problem, by all means. Again, it's a question of scale. If I've understood your answers to, you know, much better data on methane emissions, and uh, I think particularly methane emissions, and, and some of the other is sort of quasi-independent, uh, 
of industry. And, you know, I think those studies are going to do a lot in terms of the credibility of the whole, the whole process. Public doesn't trust what, what industry says. We need more of a, an arm's length uh, view of that. Uh, but I also think industry realizes that they should have been more transparent at the beginning of this whole process. And they could have short-circuited some of the criticism that's now underway on hydraulic fracking. And I think that they're trying to remedy that as we go forward. Yeah, just as we were walking in, uh, Judge Paul Cleary, where are you, Judge? Right, right there, asked me the question, what about the EPA pavilion study, uh, which is, is, is going to be famous. I suspect that EPA eventually will be able to prove that fracking was responsible for the contamination of the deep water wells. Now, having said that, there are two or three things to appreciate, one of which is the geology around the pavilion area is a layered set of sandstones, the Cody sandstone. These are Cretaceous to uh, actually up into the Fort Union um, sand layers. So pavilion, first of all, is not a gas shale play and has nothing whatever to do with production of gas shales. Secondly, and equally important, the fracking that went on first by Shell when they owned the pavilion area, then by Tom Brown, which is a company I think that is gone, they were bought out by Encana. They were fracking gas sands at a depth of 1,000 feet. Well, all right, in Pennsylvania, the water table goes down 1,000 feet. So in effect, what they were doing was they were fracking up in the water table anyway, and it should come as no surprise that fracking in the water table is probably not a good <coughs> idea. So whatever you do, don't be discouraged by that set of EPA pavilion results. In fact, is the, uh, the director of, of EPA has made a very, uh, a very emphatic point of this, that this is not about gas shales, at least in, in Wyoming. One last question. Many of us in this room are old enough to have lived through various booms and bust cycles. Uh, it can be very disruptive. One of the things that I've read in the literature about this current gas play in the large S is that there's a possibility that we will not necessarily go through the same kind of wrenching boom and bust cycles we've had in the past. Do you believe that this is so? And if so, how can we responsibly manage our economic future with respect to the uh, wealth and the jobs that will be produced by this industry? Well, if you were to ask me, I think if, if 250 gas prices continue, we're looking at a, at a drastic reduction in drilling. And that will produce a, a supply deficit and a, a, a price spike. So I think that we're looking at, at volatility. I don't agree with the EIA's long-term, you know, low price scenario. Uh, when you produce shale gas, it's a matter of economics. The wells have to pay for themselves. You know, a lot of that capital that we need to replace production that I talked about is coming from joint ventures, people that are buying into, you know, known production to, to learn about the process. But that that's just about over at this point in time. So I think economics is going to come into play. And we're going to see volatility. And we may see a bit of a boom and bust. Uh, if you look at what's happening to rig counts in the Haynesville right now, they are retracting quite dramatically. And, and rigs are moving elsewhere to more liquids-rich uh, prospects. So I, I'm not so sure I believe that continuous low price, everything's going well scenario going forward. Now even to respond closer to home, uh, the price right now is making the governor of Pennsylvania nervous because, of course, his state benefits greatly from the production of natural gas. And if, as David predicts, new rigs are laid down, that affects the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, and I don't know what the solution to this particular problem is because if the governor can see it coming, why we can we can all uh, see this process. <laughs> um, uh, beyond, beyond that, bear in mind, I'm a, I'm a humble geologist. I'm not an economist, so I can't remark further on, on these boom and bust cycles. Thank you very, very much. Let's all give a big hand for our enlightened speakers here today.
Mr. Engelder and Mr. Hughes for sharing your experience and insights with us today. I really do think it underscores that many of us who are, who are lawyers, the importance of understanding as lawyers and policymakers think about the law and regulation, understanding the science behind and, and the geology behind a lot of what we heard today. Uh, and thank you, Gary Ellison, for moderating and for a great discussion. On behalf of our friends at Chesapeake and the entire University of Tulsa community, as well as the National Energy Policy Institute, I'm very pleased to offer each of our speakers a token of our thanks and esteem. As you know, Oklahoma's heritage includes a rich culture from several American Indian tribes. Tulsa's Gilcrease Museum, which is now managed by the University of Tulsa, has commissioned a limited edition chief's blanket, which is patterned after an 1860s Navajo blanket in its collection. The original blanket was produced at a time when the Navajo people were renowned for the blankets they wove from homespun wool. Taking our lead from tribal traditions, we are honored today to present each of you with this chief's blanket as a symbol of respect and a mantle of leadership. Please accept it with our thanks and best wishes. And with that, we conclude this installment of the Chesapeake Lecture Series. Thank you very much for joining us, and we hope you come back to campus for our numerous events. Thank you very much, and drive safely.